we are going to jump in and give a little bit of what we talked about um, the following or the previous Tuesday night we were here, which is two weeks ago. That's going to bad weather. Uh, so what we what we did in um, the beginning before we started in the board of the book, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, what the goals were. And so we want to, our goals for I Am a Church Member by Thomas Rayner, remember what our goals were, that we want to clearly examine what it means to be a church member from God's point of view. What does it mean from, from God's point of view? What does it mean to be a church member? I'm not just talking about having your name in a, in a, in a in a book, or maybe even that you're attending church in that way that you're a member of and paying your tithe and being faithful. But what does it look like from God's point of view? And uh, to be able to generate ideas that will help all church members become more engaged in the life and the, and the ministry of the church. And we want to be able to facilitate discussions that will help us be able to tear down barriers uh, that, that uh, will make us effective members in our church. Uh, I love, I, I remember when I, I, I uh, at my job uh, several years ago, uh, one of our vice presidents came and sat down and talked to me and said, what is it, what are the walls that I can tear down, down for you? What are the barriers that I can do to, to make your job easier, to make it that it's more uh, effective for you to fulfill your role? And uh, so really what this is about tonight is discovering what are the barriers that are keeping us from being an effective church member or even other people, other folks in our, our church, other folks in our community. What is it that, that, that keeps them from being an effective church member and how can we tear down the barriers of that? And so uh, we, we talked about that 90% of churches are on the decline. Why is that? When 90% of the churches are on the decline, however, our communities are growing around the balance. And uh, we know that there's growth in population. And so we've looked at, uh, uh, statistically, uh, those uh, uh, in the age range of 1980, more from 1980 to 2000, why aren't they engaged in church? We are missing those folks uh, from where it was in, in the 1960s that over 60% of people were members involved in church. It's quite the opposite now where that we live. Remember we read about Michael and Leah, who were two men that uh, had connected through church, through Bible study, they become friends. They found that their lives paralleled each other in a lot of ways. Their wives very involved, their children very involved. They loved sports, they were meeting together, having breakfast, just enjoying a camaraderie uh, together as, uh, as, as they enjoyed breakfast. On Monday morning, remember when Liam came to breakfast and he was kind of quiet and he wasn't eating his breakfast. And all of a sudden he said to Michael, he said, Michael, he said, I'm just, I'm done with the church. Uh, my wife and I are leaving. Uh, 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 they just don't offer us. We love you and your family. You've been faithful. And, and Michael listens with an open ear and he doesn't really cast any judgment. And uh, uh, Liam finally just replies back to him. Uh, you know, he says, there's so many hypocrites. Uh, there's so many things. You know, the pastor, he's not feeding us. Uh, uh, we just, we're not getting out of it what we want to get out of it. We're just, uh, 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 we're just two different church members. And he was exactly right. What's the difference between Michael and his viewpoint of church and church membership, and being involved in the church? What's the point of, uh, of viewpoint of Liam's uh, idea of, of church membership and being involved? And so we looked at membership being different than membership of things that we can be involved in uh, uh, our, our, ourself uh, on the secular uh, realm. We talked about uh, you know, a lot of people, and I don't want to get ahead of myself tonight, but they're looking for all the uh, amenities and all the perks that they can get from paying their membership. And uh, you go down to the Y, and it's, I believe the Y is a good place. Uh, not, not, not a bad place. You can go there. You can exercise. It's helpful. You pay your membership. You can go in. You can use all of their equipment, whatever it is. And uh, uh, you pay your membership, and you come and go as you please. You use what you want. You take what you want, you leave. 
but we find that God's idea of membership from the Word of God is quite different. We don't come to church to find all the perks and all the uh, 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 amenities that we can find for us and our family. And we say, well, well, the church can offer me this. Uh, and oftentimes you'll have people that will say to you, well, I'm looking for a church. What does your church have to offer? It would be a better perspective for folks to really pray and find out where God wants them to be. And instead of saying, I'm coming to be a consumer, what can I get? God's principles and God's word, as we look at it, says, what can I give? What can I give in the place where God has called me to? And, and really, there's a lot of restructuring and wiring of our mind. Because we're, we're looking at church from God's point of view. We're looking at it from, from, from what, the way God's designed it. Not the secular world's idea of membership. And so uh, we, we've been looking at that. That's where we were at last week. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, You know, I, I think I said, you know, the, the pastors would be feeding us. There comes a point where when we're older, my girls are at a point where I'm enjoying life a lot better. You know why? Because they sit up at the table and they feed themselves. <laughs> they know how to pick up the fork and pick up the spoon and they can feed themselves. One day they're even going to get to the place where Sister Dot, they can make it themselves. <laughs> how about that, uh, Elizabeth? And I'm sure your mom and dad's enjoying that you're making your food. And so Brother Craig says, amen. Uh, and she a little, little, little cook. And she pictures of your, her tails. And so, you know, the idea, of, you know, we, we have to learn to feed ourselves. Everybody's on a different maturity level in the church. And so when we come to church, the pastor is feeding many people. The Sunday school teacher is feeding many people. You may feel like, well, this is something old. This is something I've heard before. Uh, I believe that there could be things, but we also have to be feeding ourselves. We have to realize that, yes, in, in, in the church, um, uh, you're going to be dealing with all kinds of people. Uh, uh, there's going to be people that, that uh, they're not walking after the spirit, but they're walking after the flesh. And let's be honest. Let's be honest. We've all done that and battled with that. It'll be a journey from the cradle to the grave. Amen. When we're walking with Christ, that we walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. There are going to be people. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you a news flash. When you're dealing with people, things can get messy. Just the way it is. There's the good. There's the bad. There's the pretty. There's the ugly. There's the sweet. There's the sour. There's the easy. There's the tough. And so uh, 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 membership means that I'm going to be faithful to God in the place where he's placed me, amen, regardless of what happens. Membership in the church, amen, membership in the church is equal with membership in the body of Christ. We'll talk more about that tonight. Amen. It's not about a privilege. It's not about a status. It's not about family history. It's not about entitlement. It means what can I do for the church? You know what's killing church membership? is because the world is looking at the church and pastors as well. Pastors are looking at the church of what can people get from the church. Amen. The whole idea from God's perspective, from the Word of God, is what can I, as a member of the body of Christ, what can I contribute to the harmony and the unity and the functioning of the church? So, uh, the question we left ourselves with last week is, what can I do to become a better member of in the church. I think what I'm going to do this evening is this. I'm going to have you grab your books. We're going to read it. And uh, that way, if you haven't read it, uh, you hear it. If you have read it, it better gives you an inclination. And I'm going to break it up into parts, and we're going to talk about it. I'll read the first part just to get us rolling tonight, and then I'll look for others. I don't care if you stutter. I don't care if you're not the best reader in the world. I'm not looking for a perfect orator tonight. I'm not. 
I don't ask you to be that. All I ask you to do is participate tonight. So if you'd like to read, you know, feel at liberty. Amen. I will be a functioning church member. That's what we're looking at tonight. It was a big deal for me, uh, for this young boy living in a small southern town. I didn't know what a country club was, but I knew what was coming to town. And it included a swimming pool, a dining area, and meeting rooms. The owners also promised to build a small golf course, a promise they would fulfill a couple years uh, later. Now, don't get, get the wrong impression. This country club was not the typical upscale club we often envision. It was really a small private enterprise trying to make a few bucks in a town by offering a few amenities. But I was overwhelmed. My parents were middle, uh, middle, middle class in income, so they could afford the small monthly fee. From my perspective, though, I had made it. I, I had it made. I, I, I now could go to a swimming pool. I didn't know of anyone who had their own pool in town. So this amenity was exciting. I could order a burger from the dining area, and we could have birthday parties in the pool or the meeting rooms. I began to learn a lesson. Membership means perks. Membership means privileges. Membership means others will serve me. Just pay the going rate and you will have the taking care of you while you enjoy a life of leisure. And tragically, this understanding of membership is what many church members hold. This is my church, so you have to play the music just the way I want it. Look, Pastor, you need to remember who pays your salary. If you don't like this program, well, I will hold my check to the church. Well, I've been a member of this church for over 30 years, so I have a right to get what I want. I don't, I don't, I, I don't pay good money to this church to listen to sermons that are long. Okay, you get the picture. Those unfortunate, uh, unfortunately typical comments come from members of churches who have an unbiblical view of membership. Their view of membership is aligned more with a country club style membership. For them, the membership is about receiving instead of giving, being served instead of serving, uh, uh, rights instead of responsibilities, entitlements instead of sacrifices. This wrongful view of membership sees ties and offering as membership dues that are titled to a, a never-ending list of privileges and expectations instead of unconditional, cheerful gift, uh, instead of an un unconditional, cheerful gift to God. So what does that, the Bible say about church membership? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's stop there for a minute. So you see where Mr. Rayner is coming from? He learned from a very young boy that he pays his membership. Mom and dad has the ability to pay membership to this local golf course, uh, or this local uh, uh, country club. It has a swimming pool, pretty neat. It has a place where he can afford to go get burgers. This is a place where we can hold our birthday parties. This is a place that we have access to because we have membership. And so, uh, oftentimes, the viewpoint of the church is that as well. Well, I pay my time. I don't want to hear those long sermons. I pay my. I don't like that type of music. It needs to change. I pay my. This is what I want, and it's an unbiblical view of what church membership and belonging is about. I love what he says here. I have a lot of this phrase in my book. For them, membership is about receiving instead of giving. We're going to look at the model from the Word of God in a few moments, but remember this. It's about giving instead of receiving. Most folks think it's about receiving instead of giving. What can I get? It's about uh, being served instead of serving. Serving costs our time. It can cost our money. It can certainly cost our talents. So serving does cost. Where receiving is an amenity that sometimes we feel like that we are we are should be given because of our membership to church. But just because we pay our tithes and we're faithful in our time to church does not mean it's a card that says, I don't have to give, I don't have to serve. I just need to be served. 
fits. Say the word of God, the power of faith is more effective to hear than to hear. Amen. Amen. And even in, in uh, well, Malachi, where it says about if, if you don't pay your tithes, you know, you could not only pay your tithes, but also you got kids oh, over. So I agree, Brother Eli, it should be about what we give. And I'm not, I, I could say a whole lot. Uh, I do appreciate and I back you and what you say there. Uh, but I, I'm going to stay focused. Because I, I mean, I believe you're focused, but I'm going to stay focused. Amen. Uh, but, but you're right. You are 100% right. So when we look at uh, what it means to, to serve instead of being served, the rights instead of responsibilities, entitlements instead of sacrifices, I think that there are some things that we have to look at. I want to say this quick because we have a lot of time that we have to use yet. I believe that we look, we need to look at our life and what we can give. There are going to be different seasons and different times of our life of what we can give. There may be times where we can give more financially than maybe even what we can give of our time. Amen. But there may be times where we pay our tithe and, and, and there's not much more that we can give, but we have more time and more abilities. But there's also there's times where all of us have our, our talents that we're able to give. And we should be particularly using them for the kingdom of God. Because everybody, as I said to Sister Rachel uh, tonight, as, as we were saying, to understand who we are, to love who we are, to appreciate our gifts and our talents. I do believe that we can increase our knowledge. I believe that we're able to increase our abilities. We should be spending our lifetime doing that. It's a great opportunity to be able to do that. But as we do that, we should be utilizing them for the kingdom of God. Would someone read, membership means we are all, all necessarily part of the whole. <clears throat> there are a number of places in any Christian member where we can see a clear picture of church membership. One of the more voluminous sections is 1 Corinthians 12 14. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul explains the metaphor of the church being a body with many members. In 1 Corinthians 13, he established love as a central attitude and action all members should have. And in 1 Corinthians 14, he returns to the messed up church of Corinth that has the concept of membership all wrong. Some leaders and members view membership as a modern business or organizational concept, 
so they reject the label as unbiblical. Membership, to the contrary, is very biblical. The Bible explains members differently than secular culture. For example, the big term in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 28. Now you are the body of Christ, and individual members of it. And God has placed these in the church. Do you get the difference? Members of a church comprise the whole, <coughs> the essential parts of it. The Apostle Paul would carry the body metaphor further and explain that members are individual parts of the body. Some are eyes, some are others are ears, some are feet, still others are hands. That is why he concludes, for as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. First Corinthians 12. Amen. So, uh, when we look, mem membership means we are all necessary parts of the whole. Sister Rachel said that in, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul explains the metaphor of the church being a body with many members. And as we look at that, you'll find that there are many members, but we are all one body. Now, I want you to think about this this evening. We've all heard this before. We look at our bodies, and we all have different members. I'm finding that my eyes, uh, boy, I wish they were the way they were 15 years ago, before I needed glasses all the time. Uh, you know, but I need my eyes to function. Well, I need my hands. I need my toes. I need every part of my body. Every part functions in harmony to make the whole, to make the one. And so Paul uses this metaphor of saying the body of Christ, though that we are, are the, the local body is a part of the big body of Christ, still when we look at the local body, it is like parts of our physical body. We need those things. We need eyes, hands, ears, feet, all those organs and all those parts. And they all work together doing what they should do. Uh, uh, now, when, 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 when we're sick, have any of you ever been sick in here before? Any of you ever had a, you know, a, a sore toe? Maybe you had a, a bum leg or a, a broken arm. Whatever it may be. You know, we still function as a body, even though part of it was handicapped and not feeling well. There may be times where, in, 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 as a body of Christ, there may be some times where things are out of sorts or they're sore, they're not working together, and we still function as a body. However, when everything is functioning well, we function as a healthy body. How many of you like functioning as a healthy body? Everything working, no aches, no pains, nothing broke, nothing incapacitated, it's all working. And so the goal is, Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, he's talking about spiritual gifts, he's talking about diversities and purposes and, and the gifts of, uh, uh, of the Spirit. He's talking about all these things and how important it is for us, uh, 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 us to, uh, to know that as a body, we each bring gifts, we should each covet uh, uh, spiritual gifts, and uh, as, as we bring them together, we, we join a healthy body. Do you know what? One of the greatest things that you'll see out there now that is being pushed in workplaces and all around is called diversity. Any of you ever hear about diversity? Any of you hear it being pushed in the workplace? Being pushed in the media? Well, I hate to tell you, but it's nothing new to the Word of God. God is always from His Word he has told us that we're individual parts and that we should, uh, we should celebrate our diversity. Several, several weeks ago, we talked about this. We talked about different people's personalities. Some people are very driven in areas. Other people are laid back. Some people are outspoken. Some people are not as outspoken. Some people are people people. Some people are not people people because well, those are people people are energized by people. Those who are not people people are sapped when they have to be around other people. So everybody's different. And that's okay. I'm not talking about not being Christ-like. I'm not talking about not seeking righteousness. I'm just talking about what are verse and our personalities and our talents, uh, who we are. But the body of Christ is a celebration of diversity. 
Amen. Remember we used to sing that song when I was a little kid? Jesus loves the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves all the different colors, and Jesus loves all the different personalities. Amen. And He wants us to function as one in Christ. So we don't say, well, I'm a part of this club, but I don't like that personality, and so I don't have to get along with it. I don't have to function. The Word of God says that we are to be in unity and in harmony with one another, and we should be celebrating diversity and seeking unification. I think that's all I'm going to say on that part. Someone want to read, membership means we say and everything we say and do is based on the foundation. No, I'm ahead of myself. Membership means we are different, but we still work together. With a country club membership, you pay others to do the work for you. With church membership, everyone has a role or a function. That is why some are hands, feet, ears, or eyes. We are all different, but we are necessary parts of the whole. Each part, therefore, has to do its work or the whole body suffers. There is a beautiful diversity in the midst of unity in church membership. The Bible makes it clear that if one part does not do its job, the whole body does not function well. But if one part does its job well, the whole body rejoices and is stronger. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member, member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Amen. So Brother Justin read there, uh, verse number 26, and whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. Amen. That's the way it ought to be. Or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. So we learn that when uh, folks go through difficult times, you know, how many has ever had an earache and makes your whole body ache? Or how many has ever uh, hit your finger and you feel pounding through like your whole heart? You know, it, you, it, it affects the whole body. Amen. And so uh, uh, there are many body parts, uh, but, but we, we, we all function together as one body. Amen. And we celebrate together. Amen. Uh, everybody's not going to be the same. Amen. Not everybody's going to be a hand. Not everyone's going to be a foot. Not everyone's going to be an ear. Not everyone's going to be an eye. We all function differently, but we have to function together so we're not dysfunctional. And so uh, I'm going to be a functional church member. I'm going to find my part. You know, you wouldn't want me to do a lot of things in the church. You know, I'll just be honest with you. I'm not as meticulous with numbers as Sister Tina. So I, I don't have a problem with her doing the books and taking care of things because my meticulous with numbers is just frustration to me. Amen. Uh, Sister Beth plays the piano. I can't do what she does. Sister Holly, she's a song leader. You wouldn't want me trying to do it. It's a much pleasant experience with her or Brother Dennis doing song service. So, you know, I know where my role is and what my function is. And I know my function as the pastor. Amen. I, I don't, I don't uh, maybe have a lot of skills or talents that other people can bring to the table. Amen. Uh, uh, you know, there are, are, are a lot of detail-oriented uh, thinkers. I'm very social in my nature. It's just who I am. Amen. I'm a very social person. I like to have a connect with people. It's very important for me. Uh, it's failure if I don't. And so everybody's different. I'm saying that because it's okay to be who you are. But you need to find your functionality in the church so it's functional. And be at peace with everybody else who's not like you. Or, uh, you know, we need to be united in diversity. And we need to celebrate the diversity. You know, God did not call us to be uniform, but God called us to have unity. You know, we don't come to church for everybody to look and dress alike. We don't. I know that Brother Craig would love to wear this tie tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we might be fighting you with this tie for church, right? <laughs> so, children in schools where they go to uniform, they all dress alike. And I'm not talking about holiness and modesty. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about God has not called us to be uniformed. 
God has called us to be unified. That means as different as we may be. You know, I'm not in the stage in my life where I'm a grandparent. I'm still a parent of young kids. And you know what? I'll tell you, I don't know everything about it. And just when I think I've got to figure it out, I realize I don't. So, you know, I can use wisdom. And I do try to gain wisdom from folks who are advanced farther than me who went through this. Because it's about we're not uniform, but we're unified. There, there are different things about us in this body that we don't have to be uniformed. But we do have to be unified. We have to function as a body of believers that loves Christ. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that's why he talks about our individuality. He talks about our, 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 our in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, he talks about everybody being different and diversity. And then he goes into chapter number 13, which is phenomenal, and we've all heard a hundred times over. But let's get a better understanding of what that really means. Someone reads... Read, membership means everything we do and say is based on the biblical foundation of love. Most Bible readers will speak lovingly of 1 Corinthians 13, commonly known as the love chapter. It is read at weddings. It is read at weddings. It is used for a husband to declare his love for a wife or vice versa. It is preached to demonstrate a holy meaning of a cafe or a while there is little wrong with using the love chapter in these contexts, the original meaning was to demonstrate how the church members relate to one another. Can you imagine 1 Corinthians 13 being read right at an acrimonious church meeting, meeting, meeting? In its whole biblical context, it might be the best place to read it. If we just abide by the principles of the love chapter, we would have to be healthy churches. Just look at some of the relation, relational principles with 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy, it is not boastful, it is not conceited, it does not act improperly, it is not selfish, it is not devoted, it does not keep a record of wrongs. The principles of these two verses alone are sufficient to cause the revival in most churches. We are not to love fellow church members just because they are lovable. There's love that will not hold as well. It is not to pray, pray for, and encourage our pastors just when they are doing things we like. We are to pray for and encourage, encourage them when they do things we don't like. We are not to serve the church only when others are joining in. We are to serve the church even if we are doing, even if we are alone in doing so. Church membership is founded on love, authentic, biblical, unconditional. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So, you know the chapter we're talking about, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I have become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and, and have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not uh, charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to the poor and give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity is long. Charity uh, uh, suffers long and is kind. A uh, charity in me is not, but it not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemingly, speaks, seeketh not at her, her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. But bears all things, believeth all things, hopes all things, uh, 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 endureth all things. Love never fails. And we jump it down to the end. And now by its faith, hope, and, uh, and, and charity, uh, the greatest of these is charity. Amen. Uh, uh, the love of God. So we think about that. We've heard it at weddings. We've heard it at all those things that talk about husbands and wives and unifying and better marriages and principles. But we find out tonight that Paul is talking to the church and, and, and helping them to discover that they are one body of much diversity, but all the parts come together in unity, and what they need to do is love one another. Wow. 
So as us as church members, we have to, and this is really tough, and I struggle with this. I don't know about you, but love, love, love the unlovable. There are some folks, it's easy for me to love. And there are other folks, well, I'd just rather go to the dentist than have to love them. That's just how I feel, you know, really. And you know what? I'm not alone. I'm not alone in that. You are too. I'm Yeah. But, and so we're real. We're being raw tonight. And so Paul gets raw with us and says, well, even for those unlovable, it is your responsibility as a church member that you love them. But God, but God, I speak the words I speak. I have this, 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 this ability to speak love. And God, I have this knowledge and I give. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Your responsibility is to love even the unlovable. And you're supposed to encourage and bless those, even those that you don't really like. God help me. God help us. That is the function of a church member. Amen. That it is founded on authentic love. All of us have seen folks who say they love, love, love someone. And that when, when the person's out of the room, they're backbiting them or they're saying something bad about them. That's not a love. That's not authentic. Real love will do anything. And so we think about what real love is about. Agape love. Love that comes from God. Unconditional love. That's what God gives us. But then God expects us to utilize that in the church. That we're to love others unconditionally. Even those who know how to push our buttons. Even those who are doing this wrong. You're going to be done wrong in the church. Not everyone is going to treat you right. Sometimes because of their own personal issues. And they have issues with others. So they may not treat you right. But our responsibility as a church member is not to say, I've done my job. I paid my tithe. I show up. No, we're to be a functioning church member. One that comes and finds our part and we work in harmony and unity in a healthy body. That's good stuff tonight, isn't it? Good stuff. So I want to read church membership is functioning membership.
corruption in the church. The concept of an inactive church member is an oxymoron. Biblically, no such church member really exists. Such is the reason we are exhorted to know our gifts and abilities, so we can use them best to serve the church for the glory of God. The fact that there is so much diversity in our church is our strength. Everyone has a function. Everyone should be functioning. Everyone should have a role. Because we are all different with different gifts and abilities, we will function differently from other members. But if we are true and biblical church members, we will be functioning members. One of the ongoing questions you should ask yourself in God in prayer is, how can I best serve my church? You should never, you should never ask yourself if you should be are a member, you must be a functioning member. It is just that simple. Wow. That was a lot of great information. That was like power packed, right? Dynamite. And so some things that stood out to me is that because we're all different, um, our diversity leads to a more robust and greater church because of of everything that everyone brings to the table. And it shouldn't be if we are asking, should I be a functioning church member? As he said, it's an oxymoron. You have to be a functioning church member because that's God's principle. If, if you're going to be in the church, you're going to be serving. So how can I serve? What is the best ways that I can serve in the church? I believe that's great. You know, I, I believe that there are some things that we, there are, there are some requirements that we have to do that are biblical requirements or some things that we have to do because of state requirements. You know, our children's workers all have that background criminal, uh, background checks that we keep on file and we do every five years. Uh, uh, so, so there's things, but, 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 but there is something for everybody to do in the church. There's something for everybody to do. And I don't want to take a lot of time because I see time is passing, passing by. Someone want to read the first pledge. It's hard to, hard to know for certain. Church membership roles are not always easy to research, and some churches just refuse to face reality. But by our best estimate, we think most church roles are overinflated by a factor of three. That's big. Really big. What that means is, if your church has 300 members on its roles, it probably has 100 real biblical members. Only one third are functioning members. Only one out of three gives abundantly and serves without hesitation. In fact, I bet many people will question our own numbers as being overstated. They will question if as many as one out of three members are biblical functioning members, but you are making a different commitment. You are making a pledge to be a member the way the Bible speaks and the way God designed it. You are committing to give cheerfully and abundantly. You are committing to serve and ministering, committing to serving and ministering without hesitation. You are pledging to be a functioning church member. Amen. So you can read the pledge, and I'll let you all do that in your book. I want you to read it. I want you to commit to God. I want you to sign it. Uh, that's going to be between you and God as you look at it from a biblical perspective. Uh, so he uses the statistics saying that only one in three are really a biblical church member. There are some other models that say that 80% of uh, our uh, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Uh, and and uh, there are statistics, statistics uh, I think, from Georgia Pharma that it says that from the church model. Uh, so so we, I, I still believe this. There are seasons where we're able to do more. There are seasons where we, 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 may, we may be not be able to give as much as our time as we can our money. There may be seasons where we can give a book, and hopefully that's the case. But I believe this. I believe this. I said to you several weeks ago 
that there should be something that we should be doing in evaluating our life and our identity in Christ. We should constantly be evaluating ourselves, saying, do I line up with, God, with Christ and the Word of God? Do I line up with being the church member that God wants me to do, be? And we give ourselves affirmation if we line up. If then we line up and you see things are off, you say, I have to make modifications to this. I'm realizing that I could better manage my time and my talents, my finances, for what God requires of me in the church and for me to be the best functioning church member. So I'm going to make a modification to it. And there's going to be times where you're going to say, wow, I, life has got me so far off the mark. I've got to radically reevaluate my life and change things. I've got to be the functioning church member that God wants me to be. And so I think tonight, for me, and the takeaway, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk. And the takeaway, I still believe it's understanding who we are, loving who we are, not being satisfied with who we are, but understanding that our personality is given to us by Christ. Our personality will change, and it will probably change upon our circumstances. There are four things about us that will not change. We have to be true to there are, there are cultural things that, that, that you know, we, we, our life experience is going to change things. You probably don't look at time the way you did when you were five or ten years old. You realize how fleeting it is. Life experience changes things. And so we evaluate ourselves. And we see how we can best be the best function of church member. Realizing no matter what I am in the body of Christ, I celebrate the devotion of I also love, love without condition, the agape love God has given me. I love others in the body where Christ has placed me. Anybody have anything they want to say?